Hello, my name is Lucas. This is a bit of lit, and I'm here to talk about Cien Años de Soledad. Uh, I'm not very good at pronouncing Spanish, uh, but you might also know it as 100 Years of Solitude by uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. And uh, yeah, he was a Nobel Prize winner. He's written a number of books, including this one, I Love in the Time of Cholera, and um, those are the two I know, <laughs> but I know he's written more. Uh, it is a wonderful, beautiful, magical book uh, that really gets at the heart of what I would consider, just based on what I know about Latin American history, uh, what it's like to be well, the anxieties and struggles and pains and sufferings uh, that Colombians have gone through throughout history, but in also in a broader perspective, uh, Latin Americans have gone through. Um, this, mo uh, this movie, <laughs> this book is uh, definitely about the cyclical nature of time. Uh, we follow a family, the Buendia family, uh, headed by the patriarch Jose uh, Arcadio Buendia, who's married to Ursula, uh, I forgot her name, U Ursula, uh, and it just follows down the line, uh, it, starting with them, after, you know, Jose gets into a cockfight, uh, over his own honor, and wins, and Prudencio uh, suggests that he's impotent, so Prudencio is killed by Jose, and Jose runs off with his wife to found the city of Macondo. Um, we, we start from there. We see Macondo, and... Uh, as the beginning says, many years later, as he faced the firing squad, Colonel Riliano Buendia was to remember that distant afternoon when his father took him to discover ice, his father being Jose. Um, the first of many Jose's, mind you, first of many Jose Arcadios, uh, and Riliano is certainly the first of many Riliano, uh, Rilianos. Uh, he has his own 17 bastard Aurelianos with 17 different women. Um, <laughs> what I think is interesting about the book uh, is that because it's so infused with Latin American history and culture, uh, it's that is really emphasized um, with the with respect to the magical aspects. I think it does an excellent job of heightening that understanding to make it more vibrant. Uh, I mean, just think of like an artist painting a, a beautiful, realistic landscape, but using a color palette, uh, which if you looked at the, ins the place that would be the inspiration, those colors aren't there. But, uh, and you know, also from an angle that you have never seen before uh, and could never possibly see <laughs> as a human. I don't know how else to explain it. It's just, it, it puts you in a position to uh, really empathize uh, and come to understand viscerally um, these kind of tragedies and uh, anxieties and horrors as the Buendia family cycles through S largely self-inflicted tragedy after self-inflicted tragedy as Mokondo, this Eden-like city, uh, falls to ruin uh, throughout time uh, through civil war, through economic changes, through uh, <laughs> uh, companies coming in and abandoning the place. Uh, leaving this industrialized, globalized place with no economy anymore. And, uh, I mean, it's, it's just, uh, and even when they were there, you know, just taking advantage of the people and using their lawyers to wash away any 
culpability, any responsibility in their own respects. You see these kind of things time and time again in this story. I mean, Colonel Aureliano has 32 civil wars uh, that he starts with his own band of uh, warriors, bandits, uh, to oppose the liberals and conservatives and in a way becomes a martyr later on after he signs a peace treaty giving 62 bars of gold that come out of, not really out of nowhere they must be spoils of war but are not mentioned before <laughs> um, uh, and everyone seems to be very unhappy with him but he's got this tattoo and then he shoots himself through the tattoo and it saves him from killing himself and then he becomes like a martyr uh, that lives and uh you know, his father, his father becomes very interested in this ice uh, and these band of gypsies uh, that uh, Melchiaros heads, uh, who is the sort of head gypsy, uh, and they come with all kinds of incredible things, ice, um, early prototype camera, like daguerreotype things, uh, telescopes and and you know just things that Jose's never under never seen before and it makes him want to understand the world and I think that's what this book is trying to do you see all of humanity in it a lot of sexuality uh, the men are always well endowed you know huevos grandes as they might say are well <laughs> I I'm just saying the men are well endowed and it's kind of annoying in that sense, uh, women are not really treated very well. Uh, I suppose that is just representative of a truth, but also, it's, you know, at times it also feels like the author is casually okay with it. Uh, so that's problematic in a sense, but not reason to put it, put the book down. Um, yeah, Jose, he, he, becomes obsessed with proving God is real with a ghetto type uh, and goes insane and has to be tied down by 20 men to the chestnut tree on the hill uh, while he shouts Latin at them. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so anyway, I would like to quote some parts of this book uh, that show some of the politics of this book. Uh, it was there that the sleight-of-hand lawyers proved that the demands lacked all validity for the simple reason that the banana company did not have, never had had, and never would have any workers in its service because they were all hired on a temporary and occasional basis, so that the fable of the Virginia ham was nonsense, the same as that of the miraculous pills and the yuletide toilets, and by a decision of the court it was established and set down in solemn decrees that the workers did not exist. This after being taken severe, severe advantage of. Um, and again, with the way magical realism is used, it, it really heightens that experience and uh, the empathy that you have for these characters and uh, sort of helps you understand, uh, I mean, not fully, of course, unless you have lived through this, but uh, it really puts you into the mindset of like, being able to try to, oh, I, that's what that would feel like. Um, I mean, it, it's not perfect, of course, because unless you've been through that, you wouldn't quite know, but I, I think it's really good in that sense. Uh, right. It happened once when someone at the table complained about the ruin into which the town had sunk when the banana company had abandoned it, and Aureliano... Uh, contradicted him with maturity and with the vision of a grown person. I have no idea which Aureliano this is because there's like 20 of them. <laughs> um, his point of view, contrary to the general interpretation, was that Macondo had been a prosperous place and well on its way until it was disordered and corrupted and suppressed by the banana company, whose engineers brought on the deluge as a pretext to avoid promises made to the workers. And that keyword deluge there uh, is vital because there is a four-plus-year deluge of rain that comes and really makes this town destitute and impoverished in a way. And it really it feels... This book feels very much like Genesis, and Mokondo feels uh, like Eden with all these wonderful 
things that happen. Uh, I mean, not necessarily always good. There's a girl who eats the earth and paint chips that brings the bones of her dead parents to Jose's house and uh, looking to be adopted because she's their cousin, niece. Uh, there's uh, <laughs> this sense of uh, time cycling again and again in a circle, except you can tell that this circle is uh, closing in on itself and getting smaller and smaller, and the, the curvature is moving faster and faster, and uh, all these tragedies are coming more and more and uh, more often and again and again and quicker and faster, and uh, it's just this horrible reality. Uh, and in a way, you know, at the end, there's also this sense that some characters don't particularly uh, have an understanding of who they are or where they came from. Riliano did not leave Melchiades' room for a long time. He learned by heart the fantastic legends of the crumbling books, the synthesis of the studies of Herman the Cripple, the notes on the science of demonology, the keys to the Philosopher's Stone, the centuries of Nostradamus, and his research concerning the plague, so that he reached adolescence without knowing a thing about his own time, but with the basic knowledge of a medieval man. It's like the people, uh, regular people, or at least in Okondo, uh, in a sense, maybe in Colombia or Latin America, are sort of left behind and... Uh, not allowed to progress on their own naturally and, um, you know, don't have an understanding of the world around them by design, <laughs> in a way, uh, because of these horrible cyclical tragedies that happen more and more quickly. Uh, and here's another thing later on. Riliano trembled with rage. So, he said, you don't believe it either. Believe what? that Colonel Aureliano Buendia fought 32 civil wars and lost them all, Aureliano answered, that the army hemmed in and machine-gunned 3,000 workers, <sighs> and that their bodies were carried off to be thrown into his, the sea on a train with 200 cars. The priest measured him with a pitying look. Oh, my son, he sighed. It's enough for me to be sure that you and I exist at this moment. Um, that's all they have, is this moment. Uh, the past is tragic and full of lies and tragedy and, you know, just not there for them. Uh, even though, you know, he did learn, uh, before we saw it, he had learned nothing more than a medieval man. Uh, there's a dis distension, disassociation with the times they're in. Uh, and then... You know, there's actually this really great quote uh, that I think encapsulates everything. He dreamed that he w this is uh, Jose when he's tied to the tree. He dreamed that he was getting out of bed, opening the door, and going into an identical room with the same bed with a wrought iron head, the same wicker chair, and the same small picture of the Virgin of Help on the back wall. From that room he would go into another that was just the same, the door of which would open into another that was just the same, the door of which would open into another one just the same, and then into another one exactly alike, and so on to infinity. This cycle is just going to keep repeating itself, but again, it's closing in. We see that as things go on. We see that with the names. We see that uh, with everything that happens. And again, it is heightened by that magical realism. Uh, until finally we see a, the pure destructive force of this cyclical nature that was predetermined all along uh, to be, I keep looking at myself, <laughs> um, predetermined all along to just be devastating. And uh, yeah, I don't really like this book personally. I can't stand the magical realism. Uh, it's just too much. I do think it's beautiful and used effectively in a way, but like, yeah, the the well endowed men, uh, sort of casual way women are treated, um, even by the author, uh, which is the main issue I have, uh, and 
the far too much magical realism for my tastes. Uh, I'm quite conflicted about how I feel, but uh, it's pretty good in some respects. In other respects, it's infuriating and challenging because everybody has the same name. <laughs> but uh, pretty good. Check it out, I guess. Read at your own peril. <laughs>